Welcome to our new series entitled The Will of God. It's based on the works of Leslie Weatherhead, a United Methodist minister, and C.S. Lewis, the great writer. Uh, a lot of the information that we'll be using in this series comes from Leslie Weatherhead's book, The Will of God. This is Rebecca Laird's workbook on, uh, on his book, and it's a great workbook if you like to journal and write along and think about the questions. Uh, it's available, or uh, you can easily get Leather, uh, Weatherhead's book, The Will of God, uh, electronically. Uh, you can get it in paperback, you can get it in hardback, and, and it's been out uh, since the 50s, so it's very available and very inexpensive to own. Uh, from C.S. Lewis, we'll be picking various places, and I'll, I'll refer to those in the study. We're so glad that you joined us. This is such an important study. Uh, and really, it's prompted because uh, of a lot of things I've heard people talking about with the pandemic. Uh, people have said, is this the will of God? Is God trying to teach us something? Is God trying to get our attention? Uh, God is trying to somehow communicate with us because of this. And, uh, and so that made me really want to think about those questions and uh, those statements and how to deal with them. And, and to do that, uh, I can't think of a better resource than Leslie Weatherhead's book, The Will of God. If you're not familiar with Weatherhead's story, it's, it's really powerful. It's really interesting. He's a very controversial character. Uh, he was a United, or he was a Methodist pastor, uh, a British Methodist pastor, uh, in uh, in the 40s and 50s, and there on after a bit. Uh, he served in uh, Temple Church in London as a pastor, and uh, his church was firebombed during World War II, uh, and there were terrible casualties in his community. But uh, but what really prompted him to write the book, The Will of God. Uh, was an incident that happened in his church. He had a young couple and he married them on a, on a Friday night, a beautiful young girl who had grown up in the church and a young British uh, RAF pilot who was part of, he was a fighter pilot in the RAF. Uh, later that weekend, that young pilot was called up. It was the time of the Battle of Britain. And, uh, and sadly, that young pilot was killed. The next Sunday, they were at church and people were trying to say those things that that we say to try to console someone in that situation when they've they've lost someone and they were talking to the young bride and they were saying things to her like well you know it's the will of God or God is trying to teach you something or God is going to use this to to use your life to do something special and uh, Leslie Weatherhead was so appalled by those statements that he um, he preached a series of sermons on the will of God that later were edited into that classic book. And that book is very special. You can find that book in a Methodist pastor's office, a Catholic priest office, uh, a Pentecostal pastor's office. Even rabbis and, uh, and Buddhist leaders, priests have been known to use it. It just has a, a universal appeal to anyone who is interested in, in what God may be doing in the world and in their lives. Uh, it looks at God's will in three different ways. Um, first is God's intentional will, what God intended for us and for the w world, and we'll talk about that in depth today. And then the circumstantial will of God, what, what God does in, in immediate circumstances, you know, when, when evil uh, reacts in the world, when bad things happen, uh, how, does, how does God respond? And, and what is God doing in those situations? And then finally, we talk about God's ultimate will. Uh, what is God's ultimate will for all of creation? And I'll give you a quick example of that. We had a little dog, uh, a little Boston Terrier, we named Lucy because she reminded us of Lucille Ball and I Love Lucy. She was always in trouble. She was always in the middle of some misadventure. And she would stand at our front door, at the storm door at our parsonage in, at Ardmore when we were at Ardmore first. And our intentional will for her was that she stay in the house. Uh, we didn't want her to go out the front door. We didn't want her to run across the street where she might be hit by a car. But there was a dog on the other side of the street uh, that she was very interested in. So our intentional will was that she stay in the house. But sometimes Lucy acted on her free will and she would slip right out the front door and head out across the street. Now, then it became a matter of our circumstantial will, what we would do, how we would respond in that situation, 
once our intentional will was thwarted. Uh, and that usually meant my wife and I running down the street, calling her name, trying to catch her and get her back home, uh, sometimes in our pajamas. Um, so we would bring her home, and our ultimate will was for Lucy to be safe and secure. In fact, one time Lucy got out, and, uh, and she was lost for, for several weeks. We really thought we would never see her again. Uh, but every single day, we checked at the animal shelter. And one day, there she was. And we brought her home. And we made sure the front door was always locked from that moment on. Uh, that's sort of God's story with us, isn't it? God has this intention will, this desire for how, our, how we should live out our life. But we're free to respond with, with our circumstantial will, with, with, with our will and our free will. And then God, in his circumstantial will, responds to us. And finally, God has an ultimate will for our lives, what, what we ultimately will become as a part of God's creation. So let's, let's break that down a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about how we perceive the will of God, how we understand the will of God. God's intentional will... Uh, is, is about his wisdom and his love and, it's, and, and his focus on our safety and security. Just as we took care of Lucy and as we wanted the best for Lucy, God always wants the best for us. And we see that really revealed in the creation story. And I have to sort of uh, put some parameters on how we look at the creation story. It's not a scientific story. Uh, science asks, how did life begin? The creation story is, is different. The creation story seeks to answer a different question. That question is, what does life mean? That's what the creation story is about. Uh, if you think about some of the scriptures that come from Genesis, Genesis, a word which means origins, that origin story for all of us and all of creation, it says, in the beginning, God created. So part of God's intentional will, what he intends for creation, is that we be his breath breathed out, that we be alive and full of life. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, the, of course Genesis is written in Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, what God, God creates is uh, in Hebrew, a nephesh. Um, it's a hard word to translate into English. In, in Hebrew and in Jewish culture, it has a lot of different meanings. Uh, you can translate it as life, uh, sometimes Jewish people translate it as soul. Um, it's, it's everything that makes us us. And I can remember my Hebrew teacher uh, explaining it this way. He said, Nephish is a baby bird in a nest with its mouth wide open waiting to be fed. It's life itself. It's the origin, the creation, the center of life. That's what God creates in the beginning, Nephish. Uh, a soul, uh, all of life centered in us. As you further look at the creation story, uh, you probably know these verses very well, and we'll be in Genesis 1 and 2 all, all this lesson. Uh, in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God looked at everything he had made, and it was very good. Um, you know, the, the power of that story is, is to look back and reflect on uh, what it means to be made and created by God. Uh, each of us is like a fine work of art. If you go to a museum uh, this week and you go look at the art, you will see the artist's signature on, on his or her art. Uh, in a painting somewhere in the corner, in a sculpture, maybe initials, in, uh, in great silver works and, and things like that, you might find initials somewhere or a, or a trademark kind of thing, uh, a, a maker's mark on the back of, of the silver. We all contain that. We're all created by God and God's mark, it, it, God's part of God is in all of us. Um, in the ancient church, we talked about the Imago Dei, comes from this verse, the image of God. Uh, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Does it mean that, that we look like God, that God looks, uh, looks like human beings? Um, for a long time, when I was a child, I imagined God looked like my grandpa because my grandpa was the sweetest, kindest, funniest person uh, I've probably ever known. Um, 
that I've come over the years to realize that's probably not what's being said here. Uh, we're created in God's image in the sense that there's something inside of us uh, that reflects uh, the author of our life, the creator of our life. C.S. Lewis, for him, uh, that was moral law, moral understanding. Uh, Lewis, who, who started his life as, a, as an atheist, um, became a Christian because of one of the reasons is because he came to, to recognize uh, through his study of many cultures that there was something in every human being that, that knew that some things were wrong. Uh, murder was wrong. Um, um, healthy people everywhere recognize that. To treat one another in kind, with kindness is good. Uh, healthy people in every culture recognize that. And for Lewis, that meant there was something that, that had been uh, communicated in the creation of every human being uh, that came, to, came into our being from something greater than ourselves. Uh, and that, for him, made all the difference in the world. In Genesis 1, 29 through 31, God says, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant and every tree and all the animals of the land and the birds of the air and all living creatures on the ground and all the green plants for food. And so it happened. God looked at everything he had made and found it very good. Now that phrase, again, good, uh, is a powerful word in the Hebrew that, that this was originally written in. Um, it means to be complete. It means to be whole. When we think about God's original intentional will for us and for creation, it is that we be whole. That image in the, in the Garden of Eden is a, is, a, is, a, is a metaphor for that kind of life. Um, there was no death there, no pain there, no suffering, no sickness there. Uh, all the creatures lived in peace with one another. Uh, John Wesley drew upon that imagery in his powerful sermon on the general deliverance in which Wesley in his own way uh, delineated uh, the different kinds of will in, in God's uh, relationship with us. And Wesley talked about how in the, that original garden, um, that was what God wanted for us. That's what God intended for us. If we think about when a child is born, we have an intentional will for that child, don't we? Uh, before anything comes into their life that, uh, that might be negative, uh, we, we look at their life and we think about what can be. And, uh, and we want to do everything we can to help them have the fullest and most creative life uh, possible. I, uh, uh, we're having a, a, a celebration via Zoom for our oldest granddaughter who, uh, who will be uh, celebrating her college graduation. And I was just remembering when she was born and the first time I held her. Uh, she was a nephish. She was a new life, uh, a fresh life. And holding her in my arms and imagining what her life could be, uh, that was our intentional will. Her parents, uh, we as her grandparents, all of her family thinking about her life and what it could be and what we wanted to do to enable her to have the very best possible life she could have. That's God's intentional will. Uh, C.S. Lewis points out uh, that there's a couple of different things we can learn uh, just from life itself about God and our relationship. He said we can, we can learn about God and God's will just by looking at creation. Uh, the fact that God is a creating God, uh, God is, uh, is an author of life, and the diversity of life is so powerful. Uh, if you think about every little thing from, from tiny amoebas to the great whales that live in the ocean. Uh, uh, God has a passion for creation. Um, I always remember the Douglas Adams book. If you don't know Douglas Adams books, they're really, really funny. Uh, English writer, but he, he has this, this scene where God is talking to a guy and the guy's kind of interviewing God about what God does and likes to do. And God, one of the things God says in that funny scene is, the fjords. I'm particularly proud of the fjords. You know, God loves his creation. In, in the Genesis story, there's that wonderful scene that says, in the cool of the evening, God came to walk in his garden. Uh, those of us who live in Oklahoma, uh, we know what it's like in the summertime. It can be really hot. Uh, 
And, uh, and my favorite time in Oklahoma in the summer is a, you know, 8.30 or 9 when the sun sets and there seems to be a, a cool breeze sort of generates and you can be outside and it's just so wonderful. And uh, I have that image of God from Genesis coming at that moment to, to walk through the garden in my yard uh, and, and to be a part of my life, which is, which is what we learn about God's intentional will. God longs to be with us. Uh, C.S. Lewis goes on to say that, that we can learn about God's will by just looking at our own life, the fact that we're here, that each and every one of us is unique. Uh, there's never been anyone like you before, and there'll never be anyone like you again. I uh, pretty much always say that at baptisms when we baptize an infant, uh, because it's just so profound and so true. God's intentional will is for us to have this unique place in all of creation. And when we're born and when God sees us, you know, God knows us before our mother or father knows us. Uh, God knows us and uh, knits us together in the womb, as the Bible says, and breathes life into us. God looks at us and says, you are good. Uh, in the words of, of the Hebrew Bible, you are very good. Uh, you're right. You're righteous. You're whole. You're complete in God's eyes. And to be anything other than that, um, you have, you're going to have to work at it. I taught preaching in seminary for a lot of years, and uh, and people would always come into that class with a lot of anxiety, uh, worried about uh, about preaching class and how they would do. And I would always tell my students, and I really did believe it, uh, I would always tell them at the beginning of the semester, every one of you in, in here right now has an A. You're going to have to work hard to have something less. You're going to have to prove to me you deserve something less. Uh, when we're born in God's eyes, we're, we're all perfect and complete. Uh, we have to decide to be something less. Uh, that's not God's will. God's will is that we be all that we can be and that we live our life in, uh, in a way that reflects God's intentional will for our life. Um, I think that's sort of uh, uh, played out uh, a bit in, in um, um, Leslie Weatherhead's life. Um, Weatherhead had this uh, incredible uh, way of thinking and writing and putting words together. And, uh, and sometimes the way he talked about things was very challenging. It really challenged traditional Christianity. And a lot of people disliked him because of that. And he had, he had struggles in his ministry. And uh, he, you know, he was known as, as being very, very progressive, still is. And, uh, and a lot of people had trouble with that. In fact, at one point, his, uh, his whole ministry just fell apart. And, uh, and it really looked like he was, uh, was going to be done as a pastor. Uh, the things he was trying to communicate and the ways he was trying to communicate them uh, just weren't working at all. And, uh, and churches didn't want him as, as their pastor. Um, and then his life was turned around uh, by a very unlikely source. A young American Baptist pastor was preaching revivals in England. He was very very popular. His name was Billy Graham, and, um, and he was preaching, and Weatherhead went to one of his revivals, and uh, someone told Billy Graham about it, and uh, before Billy Graham preached, he asked Weatherhead to come stand up with him there uh, on, the, on the steps of the stage, and, uh, and Billy Graham said of Weatherhead, no one has influenced me more or inspired me more than Leslie Weatherhead. And uh, Weatherhead said in that moment that he found again his passion for Jesus Christ and was reminded of who God intended him to be. Not just someone who challenged everyone's thinking, though he was very good at that, but also someone who affirmed people who were vulnerable and hurting, as Billy Graham had just done for him. And that turned his ministry around. That's why it's so important to reflect on God's intentional will. Now, I'm gonna invite you to, to think about a question as we finish up today. And that question is, and we'll, we'll talk about this every week in, in some form. And I think it'll be interesting for you if you take a few notes and, and, uh, and maybe see how your, your answer to this question changes. Let's say a friend of yours has a, a terrible illness and they ask you, is this God's will for my life? Did God do this to me? How would you answer that question? In light of God's intentional will, 
How would you answer that question? Each week as we learn more and more about God's will, we'll turn back to that question and others like it. And it'll be very interesting to see how your your answers uh, uh, maybe change or maybe you edit them as we go through this process of learning together. I'm so delighted that you've joined us here at Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is Robert Gorell and I'm the senior pastor. Let's pray together and I look forward to seeing you next time in session two of the will of God. Lord God, we give you thanks that you intend good things for us, that you see us and call us very good. Lord God, write in our hearts your intentional will that we would be alive and filled with life and that we would share life, encourage and affirm life in everyone around us. In the name of the resurrected Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you.